All right, welcome back to another episode of Nemo Radio and Nemo Video and all kinds of Nemo stuff. I am so excited for this conversation. Um, this is somebody that I've followed for a long time, and I know he's going to bring a lot of insight around a lot of different topics, um, including you know how to market your book, how to really have a unique voice in the marketplace, how to use content, social media. And without further ado, I want to get him going because I have a million questions for him. But I want to also welcome with a little bit of bio, Jeff Perlman, New York Times bestselling author of nine books. His latest book that's out right now is called The Three Ring Circus, Kobe, Shaq, Phil, The Crazy Years of the Lakers Dynasty. He's written several other bestselling books, um, former Sports Illustrated writer, ESPN, Wall Street Journal, on and on and on. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Great to have you. Oh, that was a nice intro. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, well, straight from your website. You do a good job. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you read it well. Yeah. <laughs> Take me on the road for your book tour, which, you know, <laughs> I guess you can't do it right now. But um, let me ask you this. We're, so, so to kind of give people an idea, um, I'm a, I've followed you for a long time, and I grew up just like you did reading Sports Illustrated. So I've you know, followed you, followed your career. I want to read to people because I want to start with talking about your writing style. And so I want to read to people probably my favorite Jeff Perlman lead of all time. And oh. <laughs> here it is. It's, it's from Sports Illustrated article on David Wells, a pitcher. And it says, David Wells is fat, not fat, P-H-A-T, fat, F-A-T. He is not a work in progress, not a lug trying to shed some pounds, not a Weight Watchers washout. Over the past 13 years, since Wells broke in as a reliever with the Toronto Blue Jays, players and trainers and managers and general managers and owners have spent time, too much time, trying to convince themselves and the rest of the world, Wells is a fat guy in search of a skinny body. Nothing could be further from the truth. Wells is a fat guy <laughs> who is content being fat, and he's in search of anything. Uh, and if he is in search of anything, it's beer. Coors Light in a bottle, please. I mean, I could keep going and I just, where did you get this style and where did you get kind of the cojones to write like that about pro athletes? Oh man, that lead was a, I, <laughs> that was a, uh, that was a weird one because that was not that long after I did the John Rocker story and Wells, so Wells hated Sports Illustrated and he wouldn't talk to SI um, and I was doing the story and he wouldn't talk to me and um but he he said I could listen in during like group engagements. He wasn't he, was, he wasn't being a jerk to me. I mean he, he was okay. And I wrote that story, and I remember sitting in a press box, I think in Seattle, and I see a story come across the AP wire. Wells furious at SI reporter. And I was like, wait, what? And I because I thought that lead. If you read the whole story, it's supposed to be an ode to David Wells. Like he's this guy. He doesn't care about his weight. He's just really good. But he didn't take it that way at all. And I remember my wife reading the story and being like, yeah, I think he's right. I think he's right. I think, I think you missed on this one. And I don't know. Um, I never think about consequences as far as what it pertains to me. Um, I never think, is this guy going to be mad at me? And what's that going to be like? Or is this guy going to want to beat me up? Or is he never going to talk to me again? Like, I just don't think of those things. I, I think, is it fair? Is it accurate? Is it colorful, or whatever, you know, does it do the job as a journalist? I just never, and it sucks because I hate confrontation with athletes and I've had plenty of them because of part A, because I don't think of that stuff. So I've had many mad athletes call me through the years, probably athletes expecting they're going to get a, you know, a hand job and they don't, you know, they get a, a hard look at them or I don't know, but it's always, even hearing that lead, I kind of cringe a little bit because it was a really weird experience for me. It's just one of the things that I wanted to bring up, and this is a podcast typically for, you know, entrepreneurs, small business owners, coaches, consultants, but such a big part of, of what I teach and train people is content and how to stand out from the crowd. And, you know, when you create content and tell your story, how do you do that? And, and one of the things about you, Jeff, is like, you really stand out, like your leads, your, your storytelling it, it's, it's very, it's not edgy and it's not like um, garish and over the top. It's just very, it's very colorful. It's, it's very much telling us a, a strong story. And I guess, how did you really develop that style? Because we can get into like Rocker and some of these other leads too, but 
you've always had that. And even in your books, it, it, was it an intentional thing? Is it just the storyteller and you said, this is how I want to do it? Were there writers that inspired you? Kind of how did you develop your style for this? Um, I guess a few things. I mean, that's all really nice of you. I, I, um, my parents always have said, like, I was, I was always a kid who was asking a million questions. You know, I was always a kid who was curious. I was always big into, like, what's the grossest thing you've ever seen? What's the worst thing you've ever smelled? What's the blah, blah, blah? What's the blah, blah, blah? You know, like, I'm the guy, if you get on an elevator and someone is working on the elevator, like, there's an elevator man. What's the worst thing you've ever seen in this elevator? What's your scariest moment? Like, I just, I like those questions. I've always enjoyed those questions from the time I was a kid. And I think that's part of it, is just being really curious. Also. I'm kind of detail obsessed when it comes to journalism. Um, I would say like, it's not just, it's not just a pair of scissors, right? It's a pair of blue, it's, it's a blue handle and there's some warp tape on the side and there's a little bit of smudge over here and it looks like I see a fingerprint here. Like those little details are really, 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 really important. Um, really important. And I actually, it's funny, my daughter is writing college essays right now and I'm, I've, I stress to her, like details, little details, little tiny moments, like make it blow up. And a lot of writers, miss that. Um, I was in college, I don't to into that question, but there was a writer at my college newspaper. His name was Greg Orlando. He wound up being a guy who writes about video games. But he was a guy and he just saw the world in a different way. He, um, he just saw things differently. Like he, it's like he, he was interested in like your armpit hair of a wrestler or snot coming out of a guy's nose, you know, like that kind of stuff, like the deep, deep details, the little things that you wouldn't think of. I always remember that and really copied him in a lot, a lot of ways. And I think that was really important. And also I used to read just a ton, ton of sports books, a ton of newspaper. When I was a kid, nobody in my house cared about sports except me. So you, we would read the New York Times, we got the New York Times every day. And the only section that was allowed in the bathroom was the sports section because I was the only one who would read it. So I would take the New York Times sports section in the bathroom and sit there on the toilet reading the sports section and digging into the sports section. I think that had a profound impact on me. Those times in the bathroom reading the New York Times at like 10 years old. That's awesome. I, uh, I love that as a child of the 80s, I can relate to all of that <laughs> with the newspaper. Um, it, it's really interesting to, you know, um, you've never been one to shy away from controversy and, but what is, you know, enjoyable and appealing about you and the, and the way that you carry yourself and your brand is you're not like a um, sensationalist. You don't go out of your way to try to make yourself the story, but obviously one big event that really kind of, I don't want to say put you on the map, but really put you to a whole different stratosphere was the John Rocker incident where, for people that don't know, this was, I think, in 1999. He was an Atlanta Braves closer, and this was pre-social media and everything, but he, you did a, a ride-along with him, a profile interview, and he said a bunch of racist, homophobic, terrible things, and you reported it. And then it all kind of blew up. <laughs> and um, Saturday Night Live sketches and, and people following you around. What did, did you change anything about your career after that, or were you just like, I'm not going to change my style just because of this blowback? I didn't really think of it. Um, I didn't really think of it that way. I just, it was a very uncomfortable situation to go through as a pretty young writer. Um, I was always brought up with this idea that you're, you're not supposed to be the center of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can do first person fun, first person stories every now and then and blah, 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 you know, dress up as your school's mascot or whatever and write about it. It's cool, but you're not supposed to be the center of it. And suddenly you write this profile and it blows up. And you're sort of all of a sudden one of the two main characters, the guy you wrote about being the other one. Um, it's funny, use the word put me on the map. I used to bristle at that. I'd be like, oh, I was already at Sports Illustrated, blah, blah, but Yeah, you were, yeah. But I mean, you know, it kind of did put me on the map. It kind of did. People, you know, there was my picture in the New York Times and this really mm -hmm. bad hat, you know, and like <laughs> your backward hat, your famous backward hat. Yeah, I haven't looked that down. But um, the goatee you had it all, man. Yeah, I was uh I was, I looked like Pearl Jam's drummer. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> um, so but I, um, I don't, it didn't change my style. It didn't make me more gun shy. Um, I think it just, it was an educational experience about how to handle backlash from a story 
and what it feels like. I mean, because every writer, if you do this long enough, has at least some similar experience. Um, I don't know why this popped in my head, but I would say, because what ended up happening actually is I they ended up sending me back to Atlanta to sort of see John Rocker. My editor was a guy named Dick Friedman and sent me back to Atlanta. And when I was a young writer at the Nashville, Tennessee, and it's one of the most important experiences of my life. I, um, I got a job at Sports Illustrated. So I was wrapping up my time at the Tennessee. One of my last assignments was a David Lipscomb, good pastor, Christian football game. I covered the game and I wrote about a quarterback and I wrote, his name was David Kirkow from David Lipscomb. I said, his passes were either, he had an up and down game. His passes were either way too up or way too down. <laughs> and the back, I thought nothing of that line. I still think nothing of that line. It's a great line. Yeah. I know, but, 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 you know, high school parents are oh understandably protected. So there's this huge backlash. And it's now my final week of the newspaper. And my editor, a guy named Larry Taft, is like, this week you're covering the David Lipscomb game. Oh. And I was like, what the hell, really? And he, he was very big into this idea that you have to show your face after you do something controversial. And I went back there, and there was a funny ending because I was standing on the sidelines. Fourth quarter, you run down to the field. You wait by the sideline for the game to end. And David Kirkow and a bunch of his teammates surround me. And David Kirkow goes, don't you ever come around here again. And I was leaving for Sports Illustrated like the next day. So there's this kid, David Kirkow, who's now 40-something years old, who's convinced he ran me out of town. So, <laughs> damn it. That's, that's fantastic. Boiled again by David Kirkow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can't stay here. This town's it's closing in on you. <laughs> Going to SI. So – one of the things I always try to, to teach people to online uh, that you've really done well, and I say this phrase, like the biggest sin in marketing is to be boring. And I think also the biggest sin in storytelling is to be boring. And certainly you've developed a style and approach that, you know, you're not boring. That, that's why people want to see what you're going to do next, what you're going to write next. Um, how, what I wanted to ask you about is, you know, you also carry that over into how you engage with people on social media. You're very opinionated. You've got a lot of takes on Twitter. You'll, you'll mix it up in the political arena, the religious arena, the sports arena. How, how do you kind of weigh that against kind of career or, you know, selling books or anything? Or does that not even enter your mind? I'm just curious how you navigate that world. I would actually say for most people, it would be best not to be like me. I really <laughs> okay. mean that. I actually really mean that. I think um, the day I'm done writing books is a day I delete my Twitter account and walk away a happy man. You know, like mm. I hate social media. I actually hate social media. It's, you wouldn't know it from knowing me, but I hate social media. I hate, I feel like the level of misinformation in this country, thanks to social media, yeah. the level of meanness, just pure meanness, a viral meanness, it, it, it's troubling, you know, it really bothers me. Um, on the other hand, I do have a career to sustain and I have books to, promote and you kind of have to do it and when you're trying to get book deals they want to know how many how many twitter followers do you have how many of this i i tweet about politics because i can't help myself that's why i tweet about politics i love i want my kids to grow up in a good world in a good country i wrote a book that concerned trump i cannot stand donald trump it bothers me it makes me angry and i tweet about it i probably would have more, more followers if i didn't like, I actually think people say, give us the keys to social media. And I'm like, don't be like me. Like, actually, don't be like me. <laughs> like, I tell young writers, don't do what I do. Don't, I can do it at 48, you know, and be okay. But if you're a young writer and you don't know, your next boss might be a big Donald Trump fan or a big yeah. liberal or like, you don't know. You have no idea. So don't do that. Like, find a niche. Be a sports expert. Be a something expert. If you want to go into politics, great. But I just think. I honestly think what I do, like I really want to run for public office one day, just I think it'd be cool, but I can't because I've, my trail is just ridiculous. You know, I'm aware of that. It's pathetic, but I can't. So, and I wouldn't vote for me either based on my, like, you know, now I'm putting this out here, so I really can't run, but it's just, I just, it's too long of a trail. So I just think you really do have to be careful. And on the other hand, I do engage with readers. Like someone said to me, Someone wrote me the other day and I wrote back over Twitter and the guy's like, I reached out to Bob Woodward and he never reached back to me. And I appreciate you reaching back. I was like, Hey, I'm no Bob Woodward. Like, yeah. you know, but, but B, I really mean this. Like if you're taking the time, you're taking the time to read my books, right? You're buying my books. 
that's an honor. What you were doing is an honor. Like you were honoring me by buying my book. Why would I not respond to you? Like what kind of jerk wouldn't you have to be more of a jerk? Even Bob Woodward, someone's buying your book. You freaking better respond to that person. Like, why wouldn't you? It's ridiculous. I, it drives me crazy. So I think that's really important. And I also think it's funny when people are like, um, like, it's like, I'm just a guy, you can see, I, I have this crappy office and I'm not wearing shoes and I have two kids downstairs. And when I'm done with this, I'll make breakfast. Like I'm no big deal. Like I'm no big deal. And every now and then someone confuses me and confuses into thinking I'm a big deal. You can find me when there's no pandemic at the local Starbucks sitting in a corner. Like I'm not hard to find, you know, like it's just, we're all just people going through this world. So I try to engage as much as I can and talk to people as much as I can, just because they're doing me the honor of wanting to talk to me. Yeah. And I think that's a great lesson for everybody listening to what, what, you know, regardless of your profession is there's two things. One thing I like about you, Jeff, is like, you are who you are. Like you're very transparent, you're very passionate, love or hate Jeff Perman, you know where he stands and you also are big enough to own up. You'll come out and apologize after you do a Twitter rant. Sometimes you'd be like, you know what? That wasn't fair. I took a shot at that person. Like nobody does that first of all. So it's like, I think the lesson for people listening and watching is like you, it's great to be authentic and transparent because we don't have a lot of that on social media and you can trust kind of what you're getting from someone. Um, and I think the other big thing too, I wanted to ask you about is how has this changed book marketing for you? Cause you started, you know, your, when was your first book again? It was, uh, I think it came out 2004. It was about the mess. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The bad guys won. Okay. So, I mean, that was pre kind of social media craziness. What's, what's changed and how do you market books differently now? I want to say two things. I want to say one thing that you touched on. Yeah. I actually am a huge fan of apologizing. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why people aren't. I actually don't. I yeah. think apologizing is one of the nicest things you can do. You're wrong. You say you're wrong. Nobody actually Own holds it. it against you. They actually commend you for apologizing. People think it shows weakness. It doesn't show weakness. It shows self-reflection, you know? So I, people will actually sometimes will be like, oh, you sure make a lot of mistakes. You apologize all the time. And I'm like, yeah, like I do, but so do you. I'm just, I apologize. You don't, right. you know, like, um, it's interesting. When I was promoting my first book, so there was really no social media and it was weird. Like you, I look back now, it's super strange. Like you would hope like People Magazine would mention your book somewhere or the local newspaper would mention it somewhere. And that's where you were fighting for these mentions in the local papers and, and articles. And I have a binder somewhere with all these clippings from the bad guys one press. And, and I mean, it's been so flipped on its head behind me. If you, if you look right there, that's the sports illustrator with the Walter Payne, they excerpt and they put on the cover, right? And that's a cover. When that came out, it was like 10 years ago. Um, a cover of Sports Illustrated excerpt was gold. Yeah. It was the gold standard of what you could get. Oh, yeah. And now it is useless. Right. It's actually useless. A cover excerpt in Sports Illustrated has no currency whatsoever. I would rather have, I mean, this is insane, right? I'd rather have a grade B celebrity with 100,000 followers on Instagram post about my book than the cover of Sports Illustrated. I am not exaggerating. That is insane. Uh, it's depressing and it's insane. And so much of book marketing now is about Twitter and Instagram and feeds and p influencers and people with big followers tweeting out a link or, and it is what it is, you know, and it makes for an interesting grind, but it doesn't, it's not as organic as it used to be. And it's not as, I don't know. It's just weird. So much of my time in the lead up to a book is trying to get my book into the hands of people with followings. And, uh, it's not what I really viewed for myself when I entered journalism back in the day. But. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's so different and it's, it says a lot about you that you've embraced the new normal and you'd realize that like, and that's what am I why, supposed to do. Got to eat. Yeah. Man. You got to eat, right. You got to feed your kids. And I think it's, um, it's just interesting. I want to go back to the social media thing for a minute because um, I want to know advice that you might have for people that are like, okay, I'm, I'm not afraid to be, and I know you said, don't be like you, but at the same time, there is something to be said. You've got to be out there on social media. You've got to be yourself and be transparent. Um, but how do you walk up to that edge and not go too far? Or is it hard to know? And, and it just has to be your own personal comfort level. What, what advice would you give to people that are like, 
I get it. I have to be out there. People need to know about me. Is there any hard or fast rules for that? Do you think? Um, I mean, if you're in my shoe, if you're trying to sell, if you're trying to sell something like you sell books, promote books. Yeah. I think number one, you can never go wrong showing people what goes on in the kitchen. Like, I think it's good to show people that like, here's like, I've been doing, I just started doing this just occurred to me the other day and I just, I'll do it every day this week. I'm doing a two minute video because Twitter videos can be up to two minutes and 20 seconds. I'm doing a video about the top eight, eight people I interviewed for the book. And every day I'm doing a different thing. And it's just kind of giving like, here's how it goes. Here's the process. I'll, as I'm writing a book, I never used to tell what topics I was doing. Never. I used to be paranoid about it. But now I feel like it's kind of wise to make it feel more like a community endeavor. And mm -hmm. like my next book is about Bo Jackson, right? And if someone on Twitter sees I'm writing a book about Bo Jackson, well, maybe that guy once met Bo Jackson at a bar and he was amazing to him, or maybe he played against him in high school, whatever. So I do feel like the more you can make it like it's us, it's not just me talking to you, it's us. I think you should always take questions. I think doing little Periscope live videos is a great way to sort of engage people. Um, I think people like knowing your flaws. I think it's okay to show people that you burned the lasagna last night and show a picture of it. I just, the more sort of, I just think people want to feel like they know you, you know, and um, I think the more you can make people feel like they know you, you okay. And yeah, also I would say, not, um, I think it's good. Uh, now I just mute anyone who's a real jackass. Like I just mute them. I just move on. Like I'm not, I don't really have time or interest engaging in people who are mean. So I, I try to get rid of that as quick as I can. Yeah, I think that's great advice. It, you know, what I like about it is people want to know you. They want to like you. They want to feel like they're part of the adventure with you. Um, and also the transparency, sharing your flaws, sharing, you know, ups and downs, apologizing, making mistakes. I think there's a craving for that with social media where everyone so, can be so fake and hide behind. You know what I mean? Like, you, if anyone, you could promote yourself as the biggest deal ever, right? New York Times, you have all these accolades and all these check or bigger it's like, You could, right? And then be this unapproachable tough guy. And it's like, you're not. And that's one of the reasons like people like me want to have, have you and put you in front of our audiences. Cause like, this is how to do social media well. There's a lot to learn from how you're doing it. You know, controversy aside, right? Some people wouldn't have the stomach. I wouldn't have had the stomach as a 27 year old writer to go back in the clubhouse I mean, I got scared going to the Minnesota Twins clubhouse, like the nicest clubhouse around, like, yeah. you know, but uh, asking hard questions. And um, I do want to talk about the new book and uh, a couple of things before I get to that. Um, how do you choose a project and then how do you structure what's going to go into telling a story? Well, I guess those are two questions I want to ask you. Um, I kind of have a, a three prong thing for uh, subjects, which is. Uh, number one is, is it something that would hold my interest for two years? You know, a book takes a long time. So you, you gotta, it's gotta, like I wrote a Roger Clemens book. I regretted it quickly. It didn't hold my interest and it's probably my worst book. That was uh, a good book. I love that book. I know. You know, I hate saying it. I feel like it's kind of the funny. Barry Bonds one was really good too. Yeah. The Bonds is better. I mean, it's funny. I don't, I, whenever I, I, it's a huge mistake to dog your own stuff because I remember, um, I remember hearing an interview with Eminem and he was talking about one of his albums. I think it was rehab which I really liked. And he was basically said, but this album sucks. And I felt kind of like a loser for liking it. So then when I say like the, Clem I'm not saying the Clemens is a bad book, but it wasn't a joyful experience for me. Right. right. So number one, uh, it has to be a book. You're going to be okay. Two years of dealing. Number two, is this something that's been done well? Like there certainly have been uh, Laker books, tons of Laker books, and there've been good Laker books, but has yeah. there been one specifically about that time period that was really definitive? I didn't really think so. So, and then number three is, um, is someone going to pay you to do it? Like, is it, does it have a chance of selling? Actually more is, does it have a chance of selling? This book, I don't know if it'll sell or not sell, but it has a shot. It's Shaq, it's Kobe, it's Phil, it's the Lakers. And I got to eat, you know, and I have kids to raise and mortgage and all that stuff. So those are my three, uh, those are my three criteria. I, what was the second part of that question? Yeah, uh, just how do you, so when you go out to structure a story, whether it's a, a magazine piece, uh, an article, a book, do you have a certain structure? Do you just look for narrative? Like, how do you know, or do you have a plan of how am I going to turn this into a great story ahead of time? Never. Hmm. I swear to God, never. I, um, I never outline. I never, um, I kind of just go and wing it. I swear to God, I just kind of go and wing it and you hope it works out. And 
I mean, you know, generally with books like this, there's a chronological element to it. Sure. So you have that as sort of a built-in outline. But I just, I, my real philosophy is, all right, I'm going to get as much information as I can. I'm going to interview as many people as I can. And then I'll make it work. That's it. It's stupid. It's, I, I don't advise that to people, but it just works for me. You know, it's almost like uh, comparing writing to music. And some musicians are like, I just play by ear. I listen to a lot of music. I figure it out as I go. Others are very structured and I write out notes. And it sounds like you're more, you, you probably play more by ear. You have a sense of what's a good story, right? I mean, I, I'm not like, I hate when writers get all like, oh, it's much like John Coltrane. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I know. <laughs> but I, um, I don't know. I just kind of, you know, like there are different approaches. I know I have a lot of friends who write books in the same genre I do. And most yep. of them, write as they report, right? The report mm -hmm. and write, I don't. I report for a year and a half, it is just reporting. Jeez. And then I'll give myself six months and I'll write. And I have all the material and I lay it out. I mean, I have all this stuff, all these folders and you know stuff and I put it all together. And six months of hell, it's basically six months of hell. You're just gonna write for six months or five months. But that's how I do it, other guys don't do it that way. I guess all our brains kind of work differently. you know. And the problem is, once you get in a pattern, it's very hard to break out of it. So even if I wanted to start doing it differently, I don't know how I could. I feel like I've adapted to this. Um, it'd be like taking a lizard in my front yard here in California and moving him to Alaska. Like you couldn't, I feel like I couldn't do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, tell me more about the new book and, you know, what maybe surprised you most. Obviously, Kobe Bryant passed away after you were probably done reporting all this and, and had it pretty much ready to go. Or, or how yeah. did that impact things? It was not good. Yeah, was, right. I mean, first of all, from a, the most important standpoint, it was really sad. It was yeah, just absolutely. really sad. And yeah. I mean, he had four daughters. One of them died with him. Yeah. You no, know, just sad, like a really heartbreaking event. And that was my first reaction was this is unbelievably sad. And you, I've never had a protagonist die while I was working on a book before, ever, yeah. ever. Um, and even though he didn't talk for the book, I spent so much time on Kobe Bryant that you just felt really invested in him in his life. I don't know. So that happens. And the, the problem is <laughs> the book covers 96 to 04. He wasn't the best. Like he just wasn't the best. Like he was kind of an arrogant teammate and teammates didn't really like him. And by the way, he had a sexual assault oh, deal yeah. going on in Colorado. Yeah, so there's yeah. a lot hanging over him from this period. And I just decided um, I would, the book was done, done, done. But they let me write a quick author's note. It's basically yeah. three pages at the beginning of the book about how um, the complete, you know, who someone was at 25 isn't who's, who they are at 41. And this guy who died seemed to be a really great husband and a really great dad and an Academy Award winner and a businessman. And I just, just part of that is because I really believe that. I mean, I 100% believe that. And also is a little bit of self-preservation. Like you're about to read a book that does not shine always a beautiful light on a guy who just died. And some of you may not enjoy it that much. Just so you know. Yeah. Yeah. You ruined Will Clark for me. <laughs> oh, I have no problem with that though. That guy's like my least favorite. So that's okay. So this is a great example of one of the things I like about Jeff um, and what you do is you do pull back the curtain and you know, I being inside clubhouses, I would see how these guys act behind the scenes. You know, I'll yep. never forget one of the twins relievers. I was doing a thing for the kids section of the twins magazine. I said, what's your favorite food? And he said the P word. Oh and my God. I'm like, and it started laughing. Oh, and then the guy's out doing like, you know, promote kids. To, and I'm like, so behind the scenes, they're different, right? You know, yep. this and Will Clark posters on the wall, grew up as a kid in the eighties. And then I read about like how he treated you. And then I've seen other accounts and it's like, be careful about the heroes. Right. And I think one of the things I like about you and I think applies to marketing and content and connecting with people and selling is we want real, we want authentic. And that's something I feel like you never shy away with, with your book subjects, but also with yourself and the way that you portray yourself. So kudos to you for that. You. I wanted to say to what is your thought about you've covered so many of these, high achievers, Bonds, Clemens, Kobe, you know, you haven't done a Michael Jordan book, but I mean, it's like, yeah. they all kind of have this thing where, do they have to just be an arrogant, selfish SOB to achieve that level? 
or no. can no? Okay, expand on no. that. I I actually hate when I hear that, and I actually think um, maybe some of them feel that they need to. Okay, and maybe that is how they operate, and maybe for them they do. But I've met so many great athletes who were awesome and wonderful and really nice, and and maybe they weren't the Kobe Bryant of their profession, but. I mean, I know just an example, not that far away from me, Sean Green, former Dodger lives. Sure. Sean had a great career. Sean was an all-star. Yeah. You know, Sean made a ton of money. He was a highest paid player in baseball at one point. He's one of the nicest people you meet. Like he wasn't a jerk. You don't have, you don't have to be a jerk to be good at something. And also like, I kind of, I think about this a lot. Kobe Bryant being a great basketball player or Brett Favre being a great quarterback or whoever. It's no more impressive than you being a great podcaster or the guy who picks up the garbage being a great efficient sanitation worker, you know, like, or the person being a great dentist, you can be the greatest, den- the greatest dentist in the world is probably not an asshole, you know, like <laughs> probably just a really great dentist, you know? And like somehow we've decided we've placed sports on this preposterous pedestal. The thing I like about Shaquille O'Neal, like the whole thing of writing about this book and the thing I liked about Shaq as a character more than Kobe as a character, Shaq always seemed in on the joke. Like you're paying me all this money and all I have to do is put a round ball in a cylinder. Like that's my job. And I wear pajamas doing it. And I mean, he was in on the joke. Like he, his off seasons were spent floating on a raft, eating cheeseburgers and smoking cigars, you know, like he got it and he wasn't a jerk. He was beautiful. Like he, his personality and his embracing of people was one of the greatest things ever. Maybe he wasn't as great a player as Kobe Bryant in, in NBA history. He's one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history. He's probably one of the 20 greatest players in NBA history. So you don't have to be a jerk to be that way. And anyone who says that, just they're too caught up in sports and the meaning of it all when it's just one way of making a living. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And I remember interviewing Shaq. My only experience with him when I was covering the Minnesota Timberwolves, I had to go and do the, you know, shoot around. And um, I I came up to about his armpit. So first of all, just physical, he's so imposing. And I go, and at the time, he had, like, an ankle injury or something. I go, are you going to be able to play tonight, or what's, what's the scoop? And he looked at me, and he goes, I'm like an 18-wheeler. I blew a few tires. I'm going to try and get out there, keep rolling. <laughs> you know, like, just, that's Shaq. And he just, and he had this crooked grin, and he strutted off, like, mic drop, there's your quote, you're welcome, yep. you know? And uh, it, it, you're right. I mean, I think that's one of the things that, you know, the, the Last Dance series and seeing Michael Jordan and what a jerk he was, and it's like, you don't want to fall for that narrative that you have to be to be the best that you have to be a jerk. But, but it's an interesting debate because like, have you heard of David Goggins, the uh, can't hurt me, the Navy SEAL guy? I don't know. Okay. He's this ultra marathoner. He's got a, he had a best selling memoir called can't hurt me and about achieving all this success in the military and in life and just ultra high achiever. And it's similar, just studying that mindset of people that, obsessed with greatness to the point of pushing everything and everyone else out of their way, but it's almost not worth the trade-off. I think for them personally too. I just think like, um, at the end of the day, this sounds corny cliche, but I really mean it. Like I used to be, when I was a young writer coming up, I was just a cocky punk. I really was. I was a cocky, unlikable. My goal was to be the best sports writer ever, blah, 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 stupid stuff. Right. And at some point along the way, most of us realize that there are more important things and you have a very fleeting period of existing and you have kids and there's a delicious meal to be eaten somewhere. And there's a great roller coaster to ride somewhere and being the greatest, like, again, like Kobe ended up with a better career than Shaq. I would much rather have had Shaq's journey. You know, I would much rather be the guy who enjoyed it and lived it up and was eating like, he would be criticized for spending his off seasons floating on a raft, eating cheeseburgers, listening to music and smoking a cigar. What better way to spend your off season? I mean, what an amazing existence. And he still went on to win four NBA championships and have this great, like, what am I missing here? What is critic? What is bad about that? Like he lived his life. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, I don't know. I don't get it. I've never understood the, the, the kill or be killed desire to be great at all costs. The Michael, like, I would never want to be Michael Jordan. Never. I, I, I just wouldn't. I, I don't even, I was at his Hall of Fame speech. It was one of the ugliest speeches I've ever heard in my life. It was just this, again, this, like, winning is the only thing that matters. Like, what a shallow way to exist. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the more 
you see inside that world and the more you have accomplishments yourself, like you're obviously not someone that goes, my life, I, I don't carry myself differently for having hit SI or, you know, New York Times. How stupid would that be? Like, what is that? A lot of people think it's the way, like, oh, you know. No, but that is insane. That's actually insane. Like, my my, my brother, I have an older brother named David, and he sells cruise ship packages, okay? And he's really, really good at that. Like, really good at that. And really enjoys his work. Why am I any more successful than he is? I'm not. It's just people place it. It's just the dumbest thing. It drives me insane. It really does. Drives me insane. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, well, you're very different then. <laughs> I don't know. Than a lot of the people I've met that are, but it's refreshing. And that's why I like you and I like following your stuff. And um, besides that, you're a hell of a writer. Like, it, and not, I'm not making this up. It's just, I really enjoy it. I think, uh, I think what people can learn from you is one of the core things that you do really well too with your books, even if you're not a sports fan, is the narrative and the scene setting and the details, yeah. right? Like even the, I was rereading, you did a Bleacher Report thing about 15 years after the Rocker story. And even that had all these details, yeah. you know, about the loogie and the machine and the arm going up and the Ford truck and the color and dropped his pen in the parking lot. <laughs> like, I meant yeah. to do that. Like, what the hell was that? Like, just little, those are gifts that writers have and reporters have that we notice that stuff. Um, yeah. Anything else about the new book coming out that you want to share with people? Anything that surprised you or was unusual or that kind of shines a new light on, on, and again, those Lakers teams are famous, Shaq and Kobe, Phil Jackson, but anything that you uncovered that you think is kind of really unique and different? Well, I thought one thing that was interesting is um, there was no escaping the satellite of uh, Shaq and Kobe. Hmm. This doesn't really answer a question, but I, I always think this is kind of fascinating. Like I went into this book and I definitely did not want it to be a Shaq and Kobe book. I could have written a Shaq and Kobe book. You could, definitely could get a book deal on a Shaq and Kobe book. I didn't want it to be a Shaq and Kobe book. I wanted it to be about this era. So I really wanted to get in Dennis Rodman's brief tenure with the Lakers or J.R. Ryder being signed by the Lakers or all these sort of kooky players coming and going. But the power of that Shaq, Kobe, freaking planetary gravitational pull is insane. And like, I would be having coffee with Rick Fox, talking to Rick Fox about growing up. Rick Fox, yeah. you'd be pulled back into talking about, like, it's just controlled all. And it was, it's just the weirdest relationship ever. It really is the weirdest relationship ever because it's two superstars. The guy you would think is the most secure Shaq is actually the insecure one. Kobe, Mm -hmm. who's a young guy, you know, Shaq desperately wants Kobe's love and he wants Kobe to want to be Robin to his Batman. Mm -hmm. And Kobe's like, F that. I don't want that. Like, I don't, I didn't sign up for that. I'm me. I want to be great. And the thing that's funny, actually, he it, Kobe came about this close to not being a Laker. He, um, and it's all John Calipari's fault. So John Calipari was the, uh, are you a big Calipari, Calipari fan? No, I mean, no, I know all, all about him, but yeah, I don't, I can take him or leave him. Yeah. He was, yeah, me too. He was a coach of the Nets. During oh, the that's right. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the Nets had the number eight pick in the draft. John Nash was the general manager and they were taking Kobe Bryant. It's a done deal. We are taking Kobe Bryant. He's their number hmm. eight. We're taking Kobe Bryant. They actually tell Kobe's parents, we are taking Kobe. Would Kobe want to play here? Yes, Kobe wants to play here. They tell Kobe, would you want to play here or want to play here? Kobe's agent, um, Arn Tellum, is convinced that L.A. would be a better place. And Jerry West, Kobe worked out for the Lakers, and Jerry West thought it was the best workout he'd ever seen any player have anywhere. And Jerry West talks to Arn Tellum, who he's friends with, and is like, we want to get Kobe here. Hmm. And so it's draft day. The Nets are convinced they're going to take, take Kobe Bryant. And Arn Tellum calls John Calipari. And Calipari is a first-year coach, and he also has final personnel say in his contract, which is a big deal, and says, um, Kobe doesn't want to play with you guys. If you draft him, he's going to Italy. He'll play the year in Italy. And Calipari goes into John Nash's office. He's like, holy crap, we, we can't draft Kobe. And Nash is like, listen, man, he's just, it's bluff. It's pure bluff. Don't worry about it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, well, then, so Kerry Kittles is coming out out of Villanova. He's in the draft. And his agent, calls Calipari and says, if you guys don't draft Kerry Kittles in number eight, because he really wants to play with you guys, none of my clients will ever go to you again. Oh my God. Oh my God. He goes into John Nash. He's like, Cal, seriously, this is garbage. This isn't. So, but Calipari has final say draft is coming up and he makes an announcement. They have like a team dinner with all the executives. And he says, we're going to take, if Kerry Kittles is on the board at number eight, we're going to take him. If he's not there, we'll take Kobe Bryant. And, um, 
you know, they ended up taking Kerry Kittle. So what a good career. He was a good player in the NBA. It was like, you'd be, if you drafted Kerry Kittle as a number 15, you got a good pick. You yeah, he was a good player. Player. yeah, that's a little high. So, and you know, Jerry West does a jig in his office in LA because he's oh, like, yeah. this is the greatest thing ever. And he knew what he was, he told Jerry Buss, he said, Kobe, I just got you the best player in this draft. Mm. And um, he did. Yeah. You know, he did without much to be. He did. So, so, I love so I'm going to, I'm going to connect Kerry Kittles all the way back to a character. I'm wondering if you interviewed for your book, Devin George. Of course. Oxford. Okay. So I went to the University of St. Thomas, which was a rival. I've been school. to St. Thomas. Yeah. I know oh, St. Thomas. Yeah. So division three, uh, our best player at the time, I was there when Devin George played for Augsburg and I did sports information and interned for the St. Thomas sports department. Our best player was named Carnell James, who was high school teammates with Kerry Kittles, St. Augustine's in, um, New Orleans. Carnell was like D3 All-American, whatever. The only guy that could beat us was George. And he would come in and hang 50 or 60. Wow. <laughs> what was he like? Because he seemed like such a level-headed D3 guy. I, I was shocked he ended up in the Lakers, but he was part of that run, wasn't he? He was. He, um, that's funny. You're the first guy in my short book, book promoting for this book who's asked about Devin George, which I give big thumbs up to. Oh, I'm a nerd yeah. on this stuff, man. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Local ties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Devin George, the Lakers drafted him. You know, he was, um, he was D3, obviously, and he grew a ton. He got to Augsburg, and I think he was only 6'1 when he got to Augsburg. Yeah, and he was 6'7 when he left. Right. He had an older brother who sprouted out really quick, and his high school coach told the Augsburg coach, trust me, this guy's going to grow, and he did. And um, there were a lot of, I think after his sophomore year at Augsburg, a bunch of D1 schools were trying to get him to transfer, and he wouldn't do it. He stayed at Augsburg. He's drafted by the Lakers. He plays in the summer league. He's terrible. Jerry West is like screaming at him after a game. You're our number one pick. You got to play like it. He's just getting owned. And um, one thing that happened his rookie year. So the Lakers didn't haze that much, but um, every now and then they would. And Devin George, the criticism of Devin George throughout his time with the Lakers um, is that he was kind of soft, that he was not a, mm. he just wasn't hard. He wasn't NBA hard. And um, they usually didn't haze guys during this era, not hard, but they, after one practice uh, on the road, they, a bunch of the players grabbed Devin George, pulled off all his clothes, and duct taped him to the court floor and left. And a janitor found him taped naked to the floor, and he had to get a ride back to the team hotel. That's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Devin told me that story. He was very honest about it. He told me that story. He seems like, I haven't talked to a person, but he seems like a very straightforward, nice guy. Yeah, he was great. Great. Yeah, I got no, yeah. no problems with Devin George. And I always, I love D3 guys and NAIA guys who somehow, like there's another guy in the book named Mike Penberthy who came out of Masters College and he played for the Lakers. And I'm a huge fan of guys like that, colleges mm -hmm. you've never heard of. Yeah. I mean, it's always fun to watch and see. And just, I remember Carnell James talking a lot about Kerry Kittles and, and just being like, dude, you could have been D1. And Carnell, I mean, he was close. He would have been a borderline D1 guy. Yeah, but it was just fun to connect. And then seeing Devin George, and I'm like, oh, yeah, all the, all the dots are connecting. Well, I, before we finish, how, where should people go to find more out about you online? Where do you want to send them? Obviously, the new book is out. Tell us all the good places to get your stuff. Uh, I mean, I have a crappy website, jeffperlman.com. It's the disaster of my life is my website. There's a long story, but it sucks. But you can go there and learn stuff. Or you follow me on Twitter and learn all the ways I hate Donald Trump at, at Jeff Perlman, or you just buy my book at any bookstore, you know, it's available everywhere, Amazon or your local bookstore. And uh, I appreciate it. I really do. Yeah. It's jeffperlman.com. The new book is called three ring circus. Jeff's got a ton of other great books on different sports figures. Uh, even if you're not a sports fan, just the writing quality, the narrative, the storytelling, you get hooked in. I think one of the things you do well, Jeff, is you make them, characters and it's just more enjoyable if you're a sports fan and you followed brett Favre or whoever and you're like oh behind the scenes we love that stuff we nerd out on it yeah. but even just as a regular reader i think it's just ridiculously readable prose so also okay. you have a podcast we should tell people about that two writers slinging yang tell us about that yeah it's, it's it's actually funny so it's every week i interview a different writer i make literally zero dollars and zero cents i have a sponsor who every now and then sends me free t-shirts um it's funny. It's called Two Writers Singing Yang for an embarrassing reason, which is one of my favorite albums of all time is The Miseducation of Lauren Hill by Lauren Hill. And there's a, a song in there called Do Wop That Thing where she says, 
uh, something about popping Yang, and I misunderstood it at the time and called my podcast Two Riders Slinging Yang, and I just stuck with it. So that is why my my podcast, because I mis, misidentified what Lauren Hill was saying in a song from 23 years ago. That's fantastic. And I love your son, Emmett, in there going, Dad, COVID sucks, and so does your podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you thought that was a one-off. It's very Jeff Perlman. It's very on-brand. You, know? <laughs> like, you thought that was a one-time thing. And my, uh, my daughter usually does the ads. We do an ad every week. It's just, it's just fun. It's, it's just... very self-deprecating and true to your style. So thank you so much, Jeff Perlman, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, man, it's been very fun. Thank you for having me.